Alors, mesdames, messieurs, chers collègues. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome to this press conference to go over the situation in Quebec about COVID-19. The Premier of Quebec, Mr. François de Gaulle, is together today with the Minister for Justice, Ms. Sonia Lebel, and the National Director of Public Health, Dr. Horatio Arruda. Mr. Premier, uh, hello. Thank you, everyone. First, to let you know that the mask that I am wearing today was made. Oh, you want to take a picture? It was made by Christine Larouche from Tricotine. Christine in Saint Monique in the Lac Saint Jean area. So I take advantage of this, of course, once again to ask all Quebecers to please wear a mask when you leave your home and if it is possible to buy a mask made in Quebec. Today, as you can see, on top of Dr. Ruda, I have uh, the visit of the Minister for Justice, Sonia Lebel, who is going to talk to you about the reopening of courthouses and who will also talk uh, of course, it's not very positive, many positive things to the pandemic, but one of the few good things is that it accelerated the modernization of the way of uh, doing things at the courthouse, for example. So many more courtrooms that are going to be virtual. So she will also be talking to you about that because we're going to take advantage of it to keep going along that route. You had the numbers this morning. You can see that there is good news. The most important indicator is the number of hospitalizations for the past week. There's a lowering of 173 people hospitalized for COVID-19. So that's very good news. However, where things continue being difficult is the number of deaths, 74 new deaths. It is important to once again look at the fact that we have two worlds out of the 74. There are 70 of those people who lived in residences, whether they be CHSLDs or RPAs or intermediary resources, our eyes, and then four who lived in other places, four within the community. What that means, and I think that soon there will be reports which will be filed by the Institute to show you that things are going pretty well, even in Montreal, community transmission is not as significant. So the situation is going well outside of residences for the elderly. <coughs> of course, we wish to come back to the residences themselves. Unfortunately, Things are still difficult in residences, and I want to talk about it a little bit. You know that we have three kinds of residences, the CHSLDs, the RPAs for people who are more independent, and then intermediary resources with most people there are more autonomous, more independent than in CHSLDs. So in all, there's 2,600 residences. Yesterday, 340 of those had at least one case of infection, 2,725 people who are still infected. At one point, we were up to 5,000. Now we're at 2,700. And if I just look at the CHSLDs, that is where we have the most vulnerable people, so the people who are at higher risk of serious consequences once they get infected. Out of 412 CHSLDs that we have in Quebec, 131 are infected, 1,741 people infected. And if we look at the CHSLDs that are more critical, so those that have over 15 percent of cases, there's 41 CHSLDs. So those 41 CHSLDs are the ones that we're keeping a particularly close eye on. So, of course, I want to come back to, and I will be doing it over the course of the next few days, on the proposal that we have made to go get 10,000 orderlies more for the CHSLDs, 10,000 people who would start training in mid-June, so in two or three weeks' time. And I wish to say, you will see as of next week, there will be an advertisement campaign 
there will be a website, websites, in fact, for the different professional training centers in the different regions of Quebec. But I wish to first of all talk about the wages, which is interesting. We're talking about full-time employment, so with all the social benefits, pension, etc., $49,000 per year, following a training which would be from mid-June to mid-September, so over a three-month period, during which the people would get $760 per week. So I think that it is a pretty interesting offer, monetary, monetarily speaking. But today, I'm going to try to take a few minutes to try to convince people that it's not just the money aspect of it that is important. It's beautiful what can happen in CHSLDs. Of course, we are in a situation where, as I said, even before the pandemic, we're, we're missing 10,000 people. So it's not as pleasant. Orderlies can't take as much time with the patients. What we are targeting, however, what I am targeting, and I promise to Quebecers to do everything that I can in the coming weeks and months so that we have enough staff to be able to establish that important relationship with the residents. By coincidence, and I'll get back to that because I talked about it on my social media, but uh, a few weeks ago I read the latest book published by Marie Laberge, Marie Laberge last week, and I'm sorry, not last week, last year. When I say that it's a coincidence, it's not a coincidence that I, that I read her, I always read what she writes, but it's a coincidence that she wrote about CHSLDs. So the story takes place between an orderly and one specific resident. There's other cases, but there's a really nice complicity that develops between the two of them, and that is what we should be aiming for in our CHSLDs, to give people the time to take care of the residents. And we see it here in the story written by Marie Daberge. There's a really nice trust and exchanges, even uh, advice, you know, the older person, the resident gives advice and the orderly takes note of that and after that we see all the advice that was given. And that is what we would like to see, to have the time to put a damp, cool cloth on somebody's forehead, mask their legs uh, or massage their legs, and particularly taking the time to be able to speak with somebody, uh, to take the ones that are in a wheelchair outside to get some air. That should be our aim. So I just want to say, those that are hesitating in joining to be amongst those 10,000 people, I invite you to read this book written by Marie Laberge, and I hope that it will convince you that it can be very rewarding and very gratifying, that work, if you want to make a difference in people's lives. Enlist. I also wish to say a word on private residences. I've heard a lot since yesterday. The people responsible for private residences who are worried that a part of the 10,000 people that we're going to be training will be coming from private residences. It's possible. But two things have to be understood. First, we want people who are not trained as orderlies. So there shouldn't be any danger. The people who were already orderlies and who had an interest in transferring to the public, well, in most cases, they had already done so. We're talking here about new people. As far as the untrained people, we're going to be training 10,000 of them. And what I wish to say to people responsible for the private residences is that what we're looking at, you know, we have put incentive measures, the $4 an hour. We are looking for financial help because we, we get it. Yes, we are going to be increasing the wages of orderlies of the public sector from 21 to $26 an hour. But of course, uh, the orderlies on the private side, the wages will have to increase. So the government is going to have to 
help, and we're open to that. And there's another thing that is important to specify. For example, in RPAs, most people are a lot more independent than people in CHSLDs. We're going to increase the service offering in care and services at home, which includes residences. So we're conscious of the fact that we have to do more to offer care and services at home. We know that we have to do more also in private residences. So on top of incentives of a financial nature, it will help. So I would like to conclude by saying that, yes, there's two worlds. Yes, there's still a lot of work to be done in CHSLDs. Yes, we need 10,000 people more in CHSLDs. If we look outside of CHSLDs, so in the community, the situation is going well. And Sonia, or Madam Minister for Justice, she doesn't like it when I I say the informal you in French. So Madam Minister is going to talk to us about deconfinement in courthouses. So yesterday was campgrounds. We are looking, I mean, it's not done yet, but we're looking at what we're going to be doing with restaurants what we're going to do with everything that is not yet open. But if we want to be able to continue with the reopening, we have to follow the guidelines. It's important. Everybody has to be responsible. We can't have the false sense of safety because the weather is beautiful. You can't think that you're, you know, the virus is not going to get you because that's when it's going to come back. So it's important to keep the two meter distance, six feet with other people, washing your hands with soap regularly and wearing a mask. As we do, you know, when you leave home, especially when you are in public transportation or in stores, wear a mask in those situations. So I thank you ahead of time for your support. English. The situation remains fragile in senior homes. We need a lot more trained workers. That's why we'll launch a campaign to recruit 10,000 workers that will be trained as orderly, orderlies. Orderlies, thank you for Orderlies. Uh, there are uh, many advantages. A salary uh, during the training of $760, uh, a yearly salary of $49,000 when you become orderly, and a full-time full job uh, with uh, pension funds, all fringe uh, benefits. And, and that's the most important part, a rewarding job. If you want to make a difference in people's life, we need you. Today, our Minister of Justice will announce the uh, reopening of courthouses. But if we want to continue the reopening to be a success, we must continue to follow the public health instruction. We must all remain disciplined and responsible. So I'm counting on you all. Thank you. Et je passe la parole à la ministre de la Justice, Sonia Lebert. And now the Minister for Justice, Sonia Lebert. Thank you, Mr. Premier. So yes, uh, for me, I am very happy to be able to announce to you an important announcement for the courthouse system and the justice system that had to slow down very seriously since the beginning of this health crisis. So we have worked very hard in the past few weeks together with public health in order to be able to reopen as of the 1st of June. Gradually, the legal activities will start up again. So in the past few weeks, with the collaboration of all of our partners, and I think it's important here that I take a second or a minute to mention how we had excellent collaboration from all the judges, all tribunals, all uh, defense lawyers, the bar, uh, the ministry worked uh, very hard so that we were able to maintain a certain level of legal activities. Of course, there was a slowdown taking into account the fact that we had to physically close down many courthouses houses, 
urgent cases went forward and we're still able to maintain a certain level of legal activity, that we were also able to accelerate or to increase gradually in the course of the past few weeks through new technology. The context of the health crisis, of course, gives us many challenges for the courthouse system, even if it's just an inventory that, you know, uh, files that are waiting to be treated right now, which are in the courthouse uh, courthouses themselves. So I have decided to launch Justice Quebec. It's a consultation instance that brings together the main actors in the legal system that work really hard together. And this table was also used during the uh, case of Jordan to find solutions to respond to that challenge in legal delays. So that table will start its work as of now, June, to help us out to get through the challenges that this health crisis has given us. Mr. Premier, you said so. We have issues uh, and challenges, but it also created very good opportunities. And the activities, yes, is going to be based on the reopening of tribunals and courthouses throughout Quebec, but it will also be based on a large part to technology. So the digitalization is a plan that was announced that was supposed to continue over a five-year period. The digital transformation of the justice system continues, but it has been greatly accelerated about certain aspects by the need of adapting yourselves quickly. And that is the uh, health crisis that uh, created this. So in the past few months, the Ministry for Justice has made many actions that will allow the justice system to even better serve the citizens. So the gradual resumption will be based, yes, in great part on the reopening of the physical buildings and tribunals. And there are also 36 rooms for virtual hearings that have been created in the past few weeks that are fully functioning, that were experienced. You all talked about the virtual trial that took place in Trois-Rivières a few weeks ago. We heard about that one, but it was only the first one. It has it wasn't the last. There was also a day when uh, 90 rooms were working at once, so we managed to increase the activities thanks to that. And it is therefore something that the justice system has now acquired. So the justice system in Quebec is not going to go back to what it used to be. This technological change is not finished, but it is certainly going down the right road. And I'm very proud of it. All stakeholders have mobilized themselves, and very quickly we managed to reach our objectives. So courthouses are the physical places that are going to be set up. We had uh, the guidelines from the INSPQ, so like what we see here at the National Assembly, there's circulation uh, areas for the common areas, distancing in courtrooms, so there, of course, there will be a limited number of people who can come into the room in order to respect the two meters. Plexiglass for the judges, the actors of the, the different different actors of the legal system, and of course uh, it depends on how or the setup of every room. There's going to be disinfecting gels and others available for everybody. So measures of safety have been set up, and it is important for people to understand that uh, we want people's safety. So people who work in the, in the courthouses, their safety is important to us. So the measures have been taken and courthouses will be ready for the 1st of June. As well, the administrative tribunals have received the same guidelines to be able to resume their legal activities gradually. Each administrative tribunal is responsible for its own will also have to adapt themselves, but they've received the same guidelines that the INSPQ admitted to tribunals. They will be resuming their activities gradually as well as of the 1st of June, and each of the administrative tribunals will set up and decide uh, the rhythm that they can follow respecting the health guidelines. So thank you. Today's announcement is essential for the legal system, and I want to end by thanking once again all the partners of the legal system, lawyers, judges, staff, uh, support staff, staff at the courthouse, everybody who has contributed to be able to make sure that the activities continued and who will ensure that this resumption will be successful. For the question period now. Monsieur Legault, vous avez parlé que vous êtes ouvert. Monsieur Legault, you said that you were open to offering help to the private residences who fear seeing an, an exodus of their workers towards the public sector. Ms. Blair this morning said that the government was examining the possibility of going 
of using a decree to have a floor wage. What help are we talking about here? What is the most probable? Is it to keep the premiums? Is it to offer a subsidy or an extra help or to go with a decree? Well, we are looking at different scenarios. Uh, first, I would like to know, out of the 10,000 students, how many will uh, come from the private residences? Also, what are the needs of the private residences? Because if a person had no training in a private residence and now they're coming to get training, well, we know that there is an unemployment rate, unfortunately, which is high in Quebec. So finding people without training, what we can say, you know, finding hands, is easier today than it was three months ago. So that is what we're having a look at now with the private residences. You also know that we are looking at the possibility of converting certain private residences in public residences, particularly the CHSLDs. And I think that the cleanup that we have to go through is to see a person who needs a lot of care should be in a CHSLD and ideally a public one. There are people who went into RPAs at the time that they were very independent, but they don't want to move into a CHSLD once they are in, uh, once they start losing autonomy. So do we offer the same services in RPAs or do we force somehow those people to go into CHSLDs? I think that it's all of this that has to be looked at. But generally speaking, we are going to have to accept the fact, and we did learn our lesson during this crisis, that we have to give our orderlies a much better pay, that we need to have a much higher percentage of them that have training to put on PPEs, that they also be able to understand the guidelines to avoid contamination, for example. So it's all of this that we're looking at together, and honestly, we won't be able to have an answer in the next few days. However, the premiums that are there, including in private residences, are there to stay for a good while yet, until at least this analysis is done. About the Canadian Armed Forces, yesterday in Ottawa, the Defence Minister mentioned that it was practically impossible to prolong an intervention from the Canadian Armed Forces at the same rhythm, you know, so intensely until the 15th of September, as you requested. What is Plan B if the Army should leave in mid-June? Well, first, what I've understood is that they could, they might reduce the numbers, so we might still have some of them that would stay in the longer term. And so in the middle term, if you will, I have a, a telephone meeting like every Thursday evening with uh, Justin Trudeau, so tonight, and I know that Ontario also wishes to keep their military personnel in their long-term health care centers. There is good news still on the side of the workers who are absent. We went up to 12,000, then 10,000, now we're at 9,300. 9,279. So just yesterday, 458 came back from their sick leave. So that's a really good trend. Maybe things will go better quicker than we had anticipated. That might allow us to replace if ever the federal government cannot leave all the soldiers in CHSLDs. Mr. Premier, Madam Minister, Mr. Arruda, where are you going to find those 10,000 people? Because I understand that you're saying that there's other sectors where there's been job losses. I get all that. And we saw today that immigration is not a panacea either because it's a program that allows 550 people max. So we're far from those numbers. Where are you going to be finding those people so that they come and work in the network in such a short lapse of time? Well, as you can see, there's an unemployment rate of at least 7 or 8 percent. So there's more than 10,000 people who have lost their jobs. The conditions or the qualifications that we are requiring, ideally, is to have a secondary five diploma. So a lot of people respond to that criteria. 
I think this is work that is relatively well paid. Somebody who used to make less than $26 an hour who gets offered a full-time job by the government at $26 an hour, I think that's uh, attractive. Now, the main challenge that we have, and that's what we're going to try to look at uh, with the advertisement that we're going to start next week, is to convince people that in adding 10,000 people, the quality the conditions at work will be better in CHSLD, so there will be uh, a bit more time for the orderlies who want to accompany a resident to get through the night because they're suffering from anxiety, so to better take care of every person. I think that it can be very rewarding, and I trust that we will find people within the population. Is that not going to create two categories of orderlies? Because there are some, you know, when we follow the regular training, it's 870 hours, I think, to get the certification. Now you're going to create them. You're going to give them that certification, but in an accelerated formula, 300 hours. Is that not going to create two categories of orderlies? Some are going to have a training of 870 hours, the others 300 hours, and they're going to have the same wages. Well, listen, we think that within three months, we are able to give basic training. Training as well that, you know, the orderlies, some do a lot of things in hospitals. Now we really want orderlies who are going to be working in CHSLD. So we're going to concentrate on training to become uh, an orderly working in a CHSLD. So if you count the number of hours that we can have in three months and eventually as well to continue with the training during work, I think that we are able in three months to train people who are going to be competent, who are going to have the same quality as the ones that did 870 hours. Well, they can do the work correctly that they need to do in CHSLDs. Just to get back on the Army, you're a little bit desperate to find all the measures that you announce uh, tend toward that. And now the Army, uh, you asked them to stay a few months and they said it's not going to be possible. Does that disappoint you somewhere, uh, somehow? Well. Quebec is paying its share for the Army. I understand that there's other priorities, but it seems to me that the priority right now, I don't see any that is more urgent than taking care of our people in our CHSLDs. And same thing for the long-term care facilities in Ontario. I understand that there might be a, a, a rhythm of work that might have to be reviewed. I saw that certain soldiers work seven days a week. Well, maybe they could work five days per week, you know, there are uh, accommodations. I hope that I can talk about it with the federal government. The tourist industry. Yesterday, there was a speech at Public Health where, we, where they said, we don't recommend that you move around interregionally, but the political speech is, well, it's not recommended, but it's not forbidden either. So Montrealers who want to go, for example, to Gaspésie, they, who do they have to listen to, the politician or public health? Public health. I'll let uh, Mr. Rudas talk. As we've said, the situation is fragile in the metropolitan area and elsewhere in Quebec. Uh, there isn't much community transmission. So I think that what we're saying right now is that for the more essential needs, we recommend that you go. We know that tourism can be, by some people, uh, interpreted as being essential. There's like a dosage. As much as possible, I recommend that people stay as much as possible in their own universe, taking into account the high transmission in the metropolitan area. That's what we're saying. However, we're not going to go uh, and prevent uh, people. I mean, do you understand? It's something that is not simple because a guideline, it's like, uh, you know, go, we're all back to normal like usual. If we say that, we're going to create a lot of movement, especially as you have to understand that people are not leaving Quebec, which is a good thing for the Quebec economy. But at the same time, it can increase the number of people who are going to go from one region to another. And uh, I would like to be able to answer that question in about one or two weeks. And now you're going to say, well, it's late in one or two weeks. But I said it, you know, in Montreal, we really are seeing what's 
going on. I'm more, I'd rather be more prudent rather than not. You know, I know that my prescription is going to be followed at 100%. It's going to be followed at a lower percentage. What I want to say is, let's be a little patient. If there's no other alternative, that's one thing. You know, if you want to go see somebody in your family, that's one thing. But if there are alternatives, try to plan other things. But we will get back to you in about two weeks. You know, once we see what the effect of deconfinement in Montreal is, I'll feel safer. Did you reopen the tourism industry too early then? No, it's just... I'll tell you. I'll give you an example. When we decided to open the schools outside of the metropolitan area, people were saying, but that makes no sense. Other provinces were saying it makes no sense. And look at what's going on right now. There's no magic recipe, do you understand? We have to open up, you know, the tap a little bit, because if we don't do it, there's also going to be delinquency. It's going to be done just in a disorganized way, rather than a way that could be somewhat organized. I believe, you know, what we're saying is that it's not necessarily time to automatically all go to eastern Quebec and cram there from Montreal, because there might be a, a bad potential. But I would like to have more data on community transmission in Montreal. I would like to see what, if we're going above R1 in Montreal before saying, you know, let's deconfine. I don't consider that I have the truth. The truth is somewhere in between the two. It is certainly not in let's go. My role is to say, you know, to, to hold my foot on the brake a little bit, and I base myself on the good judgment of Quebecers. So it's not an easy question, I can tell you. It's not an easy question, and every time we can say, okay, weren't we too slow, perhaps were we a little bit too quick. Up until now, things are going uh, as we plan them. But, you know, in Montreal, things are fragile. It's not outside of Montreal, but it's also a question of uh, social acceptability. Are you going to be welcome or not? I mean, the economy has to uh, start again, but it can't start at 100%. So, you know, ask me the question in two weeks. I should, I, I hope to be able to answer something positive. And if not, well, I hope that we're not going to have to close things up again. It's very difficult. Patrick Belrose, Journal de Québec, Journal de Montréal. Hello, everyone. Mr. Legault, at $26, you mentioned it, it's an interesting offer. However, at $26, after three-month training, uh, an orderly is going to be better paid than a nursing assistant or a nurse that is uh, just starting. It's about $24 for a traditional nurse. So what do you say to those nurses, and do you plan on increasing their own basic wages? Well, you understand I'm not going to negotiate uh, in public, but I understand that people where there's more requirements should uh, win at least, make at least the same amount of money. And uh, Mr. Barrett, about uh, orderlies from uh, other countries, we are in an extraordinary period. There's extraordinary measures that were taken. Why not open things up so that more orderlies, foreign orderlies, can come and fill those positions? Well, we'd have to see whether we are able to find any qualified people as orderlies. Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, I think that is something that we have to study. So more than 450 people will listen, I want to see, because we already have limits that are imposed. What does it bring in terms of reduction in other places? I'd have to look at the entire file. We learned that there were 41 cases of COVID-19 in schools that were found. There is ambiguity. You know, you said Monday, Mr. Arruda, that there were small outbreaks in schools. The Ministry of Education yesterday said that there were none. Is it possible to clarify that on the one hand and also to tell us whether things are going as you had planned in terms of the back to school? Well, now we have to be careful how we define outbreaks. You know, sometimes people define that as one case uh, where usually you need two or you need transmission as such. So the information that I had is that there was, uh, in certain places there were cases, but there were no negative impacts in a significant way. So I'd like to say, you know, there will be some 
and in daycares as well because there's a little bit of uh, community transmission. And it happened lately in a daycare in the Quebec region. A mother had COVID-19. Her child went to school. They had no symptoms. The child was removed. So it's normal that in having daycare and the school being open on the community, that there could be cases. The advantage that we had is that these are young children. There was no staff that was at high risk either, so there were, but nothing that wasn't out of control. And I think it's in Gaspésie that they temporarily closed at one point because there were a few teachers who had been infected before the opening period. But you have all the information on that, and how do you get the information? We get it through uh, main points that uh, the public health authority sent to us. I get a file every morning at 9 where I am told this is what happened in our territory and in our region, and I'm given the information uh, because in our systems, you know, looking for that data, uh, this teacher, that school, it's not necessarily done. It's on the basis of information that we get in, you know, uh, the main points that public health authorities give us. Mr. Legault, why has your government, you refused to have a parliamentary consultation on the data, as Quebec Solidaire was requiring this morning, since there are commissioners to information that wanted that information, it has to be subjected to parliamentary surveillance, that negotiation. Well, First, the opposition is asking for a parliamentary commission on a different subject pretty much every day. At some point, we can't have uh, parliamentary commissions that are on sub all, every subject that is required by or asked for by the opposition. Now, I still want to get back to tracing, contact tracing. First, it has to be done with the permission of the person. So we're not going to use data without having the permission of the person. And we're going to make sure that there's safety on the data. And it gives me the opportunity of passing over the mic to the Minister of Justice to perhaps better answer. Well, very generally, you said it very well, Mr. Premier. In the hypothesis where such an application would be suggested or judged to be necessary by public health because that's what it is, that public health judges that it's necessary under the circumstances, well, it wouldn't be done without the consent of people. There would be there would be necessary to make the uh, data anonymous, and all of that would be done in respecting people's private life and to make sure that personal information be respected. So the CAI, the Commission of Access to Information, they would be involved in the information, and of course, my team and myself for uh, the personal information would also be involved to make sure and be quite assured that we'll make sure that people's uh, personal data are protected. But the starting point is people's consent. That's clear. Mr. Premier, you said earlier on that we might have to help the private residences for the elderly so that wages go up. But what is it? You know, we know that there's different dimensions. What about the big ones like Chartwell or Residence Soleil? Do they really need help to finance the wages of these uh, orderlies? Well, right now there are premiums of $4 an hour, which are given. We are in a transition period. We, are, we all agree that even the big residences or private ones are going to have to better pay their orderlies in the upcoming years. So there are two possibilities, or they charge more from the citizens, or the government makes an effort to help those citizens that want to go in those residences. So that is part of the analysis that is being done. And for the time being, as I was saying earlier on, the premiums that are there are going to stay as long as you know we are still analyzing. But would it be possible to know how many files are 
or waiting right now that the work be done in courthouses? Well, it's very difficult to give a number right now. You know, there are many kinds of files of inventories, if, if I could say so, and it's very difficult to give a, a, a number what are those because there were files that already existed before COVID that did not proceed because they were not judged to be urgent under the circumstances. There's also some that were filing to be, that were waiting to be filed that weren't initiated and all the files as well that come from the situation that we're experiencing, you know, uh, people uh, contesting things, for example. And it's really difficult to give a number to that and it's a secret for no one. The files are not digitalized in courthouses either. So we are doing that. We've made a lot of progress in the past few weeks to give technological means to be able to proceed, but we're still working on all that. I'm going to use a term that you may need to uh, forgive, but I hear some orderly say, Mr. Premier, you are, you are seeing the world through rose-colored uh, glasses. You know, it's going to be almost impossible to find these people. What do you say? Well, listen, of course, right now we're missing 10,000 employees, and we were missing 10,000 employees before the crisis. So, of course, the orderlies have a lot less time to be able to take care of, of the residents. Uh, that's very clear, and I said it earlier on, and I'm not denying it. But I dare dream that in Quebec we can, by adding those 2,000 people amongst other measures, to have enough people to better care for our residents of our elderly who have built Quebec for me. It's important. It's always been in our priorities, and it remains so. And also to offer an, envi an environment with the homes for the elderly that's a lot more beautiful than what we're offering right now. My colleague talked about it earlier on, the big residences, and I remember as of the first press conferences when you talked about Aaron and you were talking about uh, the leases that were huge, you know, $10,000 per month. Mr. Premier, are you going to require those amounts? Because you're subsidizing them right now to get through the crisis, but they are still asking for those big amounts. Well, listen, we just went through a crisis. So during the crisis, it was normal that we did what was necessary in order to be able to draw, keep the orderlies even in private residences. It's not because a private residence is private that the people who live there are not just as important for us. They're all Quebecers. So I think that we had to act quickly. Now, we are going to take the time to analyze, in fact, uh, the different possibilities and the different agreements as well that exist, because in certain cases, it's the government that uh, reserves spots in the private sector. And in certain cases, there's a contribution that comes from other people according to a predetermined grid, and in other places, it's completely free. And there are very high prices that are charged. But it has to be understood that we are going to better pay orderlies in the public and the private sector in the next few years, and we have to find a balance because at the end of the day, it's always the same people who pay. Last question in French. Madame Lebel, there was already a delay before. The number of files have not necessarily, I mean, you haven't mentioned it, but you know, how are we going to catch up? Is it going to be more hours? Uh, in court, what is the strategy? Well, maybe just to rectify part of it, the delay wasn't there before. Naturally, since 2016 with Jordan, we had files that were from before Jordan that had already accumulated a certain delay. So those files, but all the ones that were uh, you that were filed since 2017, they were in the prescribed time between 18 and 30 months. You know what had been uh, planned for. And these are files that had accumulated delays before. So we had a good situation before the pandemic in terms of the management of uh, the delays and justice. But now you're right, we have to find a solution. And 
The justice table is part of, is going to be part of its mandate. So the virtual rooms are going to allow us during the pandemic, of course, to be able to compensate for the reduction of activities with the physical rooms because there's the rules with distancing and we are not going to be at 100% of our capacity right away. However, those virtual rooms are going to stay after. They're going to be part of what is going to help us reduce the accumulated cases and extend the hours, perhaps, where we can proceed in one day. The judges are also going along with solutions. So it's, going to, it's not a one you know, solution. So the justice table is going to be used for that. question. <laughs> Um, <laughs> three weeks that schools and high schools have been no that schools have been open outside of the MMC do you consider I mean there were a lot of criticisms at the beginning of May do you think it's been successful well for me if it hadn't been a success I think that in your media we would have been reading it so I consider that it's a great success and I would like for us to talk about it more in the media, but uh, perhaps I can let Dr. Aruda complete. But I consider that it's, uh, it's a great success, considering the number of children, the worries that certain parents had. Yeah, I think it's a great success. And if you allow me, I was uh, I had a meeting with the pediatricians and Ministry for the Family and for Education and uh, the Minister for Leisure and Sport. Clearly, things went well. It went well. The children were happy to go back to school. The parents uh, were uh, relieved, and the parents have really gone to another step, if you allow me, and it's normal to have fears. Um, I think that it is normal and quite uh, normal in the context of where we are, you know. And the experience was very positive, and there's also things that we managed to learn and that we'll keep in this for next year, for back to school next year. So once again, young population with a risk, a much lower risk of disease than the inconveniences of leaving them at home confined in terms of development, you know. Uh, the first five years of life are major in the development of children. And even, you know, we are looking at uh, how we could even go further in different approaches for back to school in the fall that would allow us to avoid great epidemics. But as I was saying, it's clear that uh, there will be cases such as there were a few before, but everything was under control and there's no horror stories. And it's the professors and the children and the parents who are happy. English questions. And we'll start today with Philo Tim, Montreal Gazette. Good day. Um, Mr. Arruda, you, you uh, just mentioned several times, and you did yesterday as well, that the situation in Montreal is still fragile. Um, can you elaborate on that? What do you mean um, uh, by fragile and what uh, risks happening in the coming days? Okay. F first of all, the situation is fragile because uh, it's clear that we had the, the criteria to go opening, okay? But the speed on what uh, things are going to go opening and the way people will respect the conditions of distanciation using max and, and hygiene and also the uh, people getting together, respecting three families, less than 10 persons and everything, could have a tremendous impact on the local transmission. There is a high-density population, there is people at risk, poor people in some, in some communities, high density. If things go flame again, it can make us go into more cases and cases. And at that moment, stress a lot the healthcare system, which is have some capacity, but could not tolerate, uh, uh, I would say, a big outbreak. And so what we have um, saved by our stopping everything We'll, we would like to keep it as a, a not repeating uh, an error of too much uh, the confinement and also people not respecting the, 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 the rules. Uh, we've spoken a lot this week about uh, deconfinement, um, but question for Mr. Legault. Uh, there have been uh, 200 deaths still this week 
um, in the, from COVID-19. What message do you have for the families and, uh, peop and, and families of people who have died? It's terrible uh, what's happening. And unfortunately, when I look at the number of people infected in our uh, CHSLD, we may have uh, more to come. We'll do all what we can to try to, to, to save uh, as many as possible, but it's terrible uh, to talk about 4,000 4, uh, deaths. So, uh, of course, uh, we have to be careful uh, 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 about saying that uh, it's a special situation in Quebec. I know that your friend is saying that a lot. Uh, but uh, when you compare with other large cities in North America, in the northeast of North America, our uh, rates are comparable. So the virus was uh, very tough. And people who travel, especially to Europe, they were hurt a lot. Uh, New York, Boston, Chicago, Detroit, uh, Philadelphia, everywhere. I, I mentioned that uh, quite often you express your sympathies. Yeah for the people that have died. Yeah, yeah, and I still continue to express my sympathy uh, uh, with the people uh, who died. Thank you. Next question. Yes, you want to ask something? Everybody has been shaken by this terrible story, and I think everybody is now trying to do the best for minimizing the impact of the COVID on the elderly people. But it's clear there's going to be there is always going to be that people who are more risk of the disease. But I think uh, there is a lot of lesson learned from that story from here, from elsewhere in the world. So everybody is working a lot to minimize the impact in the next months. So next question, Samuel Pouliot, CTV News. Um, hi, I'm Mr. Legault. Uh, what do you say to the private sector? who are worried uh, they will be left without uh, any employees uh, once you uh, start uh, recruiting workers at a better pay? Okay. First, what I'm saying is that uh, the 10,000 people we're looking for are people that are not trained. So they, they don't have the qualification to be a, a préposé bénéficiaire. So uh, we're talking about uh, uh, people this kind of people uh, uh, are available right now with the very high unemployment rate. That, that's the first thing I say. Second thing is we'll help uh, private sector uh, financially. We're doing it right now and we'll look, make an analysis exactly how can we help them. The other thing we say is that uh, many of those residences are not CHSLD. They are places where you have uh, people with more autonomy. And it's important that at home uh, services, more uh, services be given by uh, GP, uh, general practitioner, nurses going to the different residences. So we'll increase those services. Okay, and um, there's a specific case at my own needs a geriatric center where the number of infections and deaths uh, seems a little bit out of date because the situation seems uh, worse on the ground. Um, what do you know about the, this case specifically and are you considering sending the army? Which place are you talking my, about? My, uh, my own needs. My own my. I'm not aware. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware. We know that uh, about numbers. We know that there is delays on getting the, the, the number here at the ministry based on the field. But I've been not noticed a specific problem. I will make verification with Dr. Milan Drouin in Montreal. Okay. Question is from Raquel Fletcher, Global News. Ontario has just over 26,000 total cases and almost 20,000 of those have recovered. Quebec is almost 49,000 total cases with only 14,500 recovered. Uh, Quebec's recovery should be much uh, closer to uh, 40,000. So why are so few people recovering here? Okay. First, I want to repeat that uh, so far today, Quebec did 65,000 uh, tests per million people. In Ontario, they did 
43,000 uh, tests per million of people. So we did something like 50% uh, more tests. But we uh, choose in Quebec, that was a, the decision of Dr. Arruda, to test people with symptoms uh, and not put so much focus on testing people that don't have any more symptoms. So uh, I realize uh, very well that when we compare, uh, right now people that recovered, we have 15,000, but we know that in reality the number is a lot higher, but it's not a priority for me to identify the case that uh, are... Uh, yes. and, and depending of the criteria used as testing for being negative, okay? needing to have two tests negative to be considered really, uh, I would say, rehabilitation, that that's not always the same project. We could also say that if people have been with no symptoms for 14 days and they, uh, they have begun their disease at 14 days, they have been no symptoms for more than 48 hours and everything, that could be making a clinical definition of rehabilitation, but we don't use that. So it's why probably, there is probably more than that, we want to be more conservative than less, and in, in fact, that's a good story uh, for us, but we are focusing on the problems. And, and, but, that's the, but I think people in Quebec will recover as others. It's, there is no biologic reason why it could be different. All right, and as a second question for Raquel Fletcher, uh, why don't you send uh, civil servants now to help in the uh, CHSLDs and uh, what is your plan B if you don't get the 10,000 long-term care workers? Nurses are exhausted. Okay, uh, first what we need uh, more in our CHSLD is more uh, trained employees. Right now we got 10,000 people and we still have 10,000 uh, people that came from the uh, website uh, Je Contribue uh, they are still there, but most of them, they are not trained. So what we really want to uh, have more in our CHSLD is people that have been trained. Thank you. And for our uh, last question, Skatsoni, CBC News. Good afternoon to all of you. Premier Legault, uh, the uh, National Defense Minister um, is a former military officer. So this is his job to protect his army. So when he said yesterday, we won't be able to go that duration. When you have our people working seven days uh, a week and 12 hours a day, it's not sustainable. Now, uh, what are the words you'll choose when you'll have this uh, phone conference call with the premiers and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau uh, asking uh, for the soldiers, so you you don't look like you're begging the federal to send you those soldiers. Mm -hmm. What are the, the words but you choose? First, uh, we're not asking uh, those soldiers to work uh, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, for me, eight hours a day, uh, five days a week would be uh, good for me. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't know why they work uh, uh, this way. Uh, I think the. It would be better if they worked like other employees we have, which is normal hours during a day and a week. But after June, we need them. So what will they do if they go away? I guess they must have something more important to do, what it is. Okay. Second question. Um, Mrs. Lebel. You talked about those uh, court who, uh, courtrooms that are virtual. Uh, there are 90 of them, or 140. 126. 126. Yes. Uh, if I'm a citizen and I hear this, what are the gains for citizens having those virtual uh, courtrooms? Because justice is such an important human experience. And there are so many things going around in the courtroom. Like you, 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 you've been through this so many times. So why a citizen should feel that he's going to gain from this new technological experience? The first gain is access. But you're so right. It's not. It's not uh, well adapted for any case, or any type of case. But if you think think about uh, um, small claim courts. 
that that could be done over the internet, uh, over over a, a virtual courtroom. I'm not talking about a sexual assault case, but I'm talking about maybe civil court, uh, 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 something uh, that is more uh, w less of a human. Uh, interaction, if I could uh, uh, take your word. So access is the gain. Right now for the system is the fact that we could maintain. So it's not, but it's not ideal in any type of court. You're right. And we will have also what we call uh, semi-virtuel. So that's going to be full physical, if I can say it like that. Uh, right now, it's going to be slow motion. It's going to be full virtual, but uh, also you, we could have all type of arrangements where we have maybe the witness in fr with the judge, but the, the lawyers is in another, another room. So there's adaptation that we can make with that. But you're right. It's not, it's not adapted for all cases, but we will uh, manage that. But it's access. The, the main gain is access. So thank you all.